Okay, everybody, welcome back to another class. So today we're going to be talking about the endocrine system. As always, I've given you learning objectives, and there's a handout online that you can either pull up as a Word or PDF document, or you can print out. The way that the lecture is going to go today is we're going to begin by talking about our first set of key points. What's an endocrine versus an exocrine gland? What's meant by a target cell? And what are the two types of hormones we need to know for this class? Then we're going to start talking about an overview of all the structures you need to know. We're going to focus on the hypothalamus, which is a brain structure, and that brain structure controls the pituitary gland, which is an endocrine structure. We're then going to shift our focus to talking about specific glands. We're going to have a short discussion of the thyroid glands, the parathyroid glands, the adrenal glands, and the pancreas and diabetes. And then we're going to end the conversation for today. So here are your learning objectives. Uh, feel free to peruse them as we go through. And what we're going to do is we're going to jump directly into it. So there are two systems of homeostasis, the nervous system and the endocrine system. The reason that we refer to these as systems of homeostasis is because they're capable of detecting, processing, and responding to information, and then telling other organ systems what to do. So for example, the nervous system, when a bus is coming at you, you have visual information coming in, it's processed in your brain, and the nervous system sends immediate short-lived motor responses to move you out of the way of that bus. The endocrine system is also capable of detecting, processing, and responding to information, but it does it a little bit more slowly, and it does it in a different way. So whereas the nervous system uses electrical signals and chemical messengers called neurotransmitters, the endocrine system uses chemical messengers called hormones. Those hormones are secreted into the blood. They travel through the bloodstream to distant target cells where they mediate long-term responses. So it's a very long-lived response. It's a much longer-lived response than the nervous system. So it takes longer for the endocrine system to respond to things, but when it does, it can tell those different organs what to do for a longer period of time. So when I say is it predominantly nervous or predominantly endocrine system, what we're talking about with the endocrine system is those things that we mediate day in and day out, those kind of long-term activities. So sexual reproduction and, and the maintenance of secondary sex characteristics, like uh, where hair grows, the pitch of your voice due to the tension on your vocal cords, muscle deposition, adipose deposition. Those are predominantly endocrine system mediated um, uh, physiological processes. Metabolism, right? At what rate are cells burning energy? That's another predominantly endocrine system mediated uh, process. The regulation of our internal environment, things like our water balance, our temperature, our electrolyte balance. I won't say they're entirely, but they're predominantly endocrine system regulated. So the nervous system and the endocrine system actually work together all the time, and we're going to delve into that in a very superficial way. It's what's called neuroendocrine regulation. So when you think about the endocrine system, think about it doesn't work as quickly as the nervous system. It uses these chemical messengers called hormones, and these hormones right, travel through the blood. They bind to target cells, but once they exert their effect, they can exert their effect for a prolonged period of time. So when you think about the follow-along one on your sheet, it asks you to distinguish between an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. Now that's a really important distinction because exocrine glands are different than endocrine glands and I know we talked about this in this class already but we're going to go back and kind of review. So exocrine glands consist of what's called a secretory portion. These are usually simple cuboidal epithelial cells and they produce a product, what's called a secretory product. That secretory product is then funneled into a duct, D-U-C-T, and that duct ultimately, right, transports that product onto a surface. That surface could be the lumen of your GI tract. That surface could be the surface of your skin. So to give a few examples, like the mucous glands lining your GI tract, your sweat glands, the mammary glands, they all produce a secretory product, which is ultimately moved into a duct, and that du duct transmits that product onto a surface. So if I said, what is the secretory product of a sweat gland? The secretory product of a sweat gland would be sweat. So the cells lining the gland would produce that sweat. That sweat would be funneled into a duct, and that duct would transport that sweat to a surface where it serves a function, in this case, evaporating and cooling you off. 
Endocrine glands are a little bit different. Endocrine glands aren't associated with ducts that release onto surfaces. Rather, endocrine glands are richly perfused with a type of blood vessel called the capillary. So they have these little capillaries running through them. And endocrine glands, the secretory product of an endocrine gland is always going to be a hormone. The secretory product of an endocrine gland is a chemical messenger called a hormone. And it secretes that chemical messenger or hormone into the blood. That hormone or chemical messenger is then taken or transported in the blood to distant target cells where it binds to receptors and exerts some kind of physiological response. So when you think about kind of the textbook definition of what a hormone is, a hormone is a chemical messenger secreted directly into the blood that travels through the blood and binds to distant target cells. And think about that for the exam. So it's a little bit different than an exocrine gland. Now, when we think about our traditional endocrine structures, the structures that are going to be really important for you guys to know, one, the hypothalamus. Now, that is not an endocrine structure, but it plays a very important role in mediating a lot of the endocrine um, responses that we're going to talk about today. Especially, I mean, really, we're talking about neuroendocrine regulation. We're talking about the fact that a brain structure the hypothalamus, which is part of your nervous system, controls the pituitary gland, which is part of your endocrine system. So whenever you hear things like HP axis, what you're talking about are physiological processes in which the hypothalamus is controlling the pituitary gland and then the pituitary gland is releasing a hormone. So it stands for hypothalamic pituitary axis. There's a very tight link between those. And one of the most important functions that I had you, uh, that we discussed in class when we were talking about the brain, is the fact that the hypothalamus, which is a structure in the brain, part of the diencephalon, controls the pituitary gland. So that's really important. So that's a brain structure, but it controls a very important endocrine structure. And in so doing, it regulates a lot of the neuroendocrine responses that we're going to talk about today. Now, the pituitary gland is an endocrine structure. It's a really important gland. Some textbooks refer to it as a master gland. We'll talk about some of the functions of that right now. We're just talking about being able to identify the different glands. Now, if you go down to the region directly over the thyroid cartilage, kind of mid-cervical right here in your neck, if you feel on the anterior portion of this region on your neck, there's a gland that actually wraps around directly below our larynx and even kind of comes up and drapes over our larynx or our voice box. And that gland that you can feel located about right here is called the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland, really important. We're going to talk about it. Now, on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, even though it shows you anterior on this particular image, there are groups of tissues, right? They're essentially bundles of structurally and functionally unique tissue or histologically and functionally unique tissue referred to as the parathyroid glands, which mean around the thyroid gland. They're not on the anterior aspect of the thyroid gland. They're actually on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland, you can palpate. You can actually feel it. Now, the thymus, on the other hand, is deep to the sternum and it rests right over the heart. So don't mistake the thyroid gland with the thymus. The thymus releases hormones and has a very important role in immune function, and we're not going to talk about it much today because we're going to talk about that when we get to the immune system and when we talk about our lymphatic system. So the thymus rests right over the heart. Don't mistake the two. Thyroid, thymus. You can feel the thyroid. You can't feel the thymus, right? Or you could if you were a terminator with a, the ability to morph metal and puncture your sternum, but you don't want to feel your thymus. So then we come down to the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands rest on top of the kidneys. Now the pancreas, I know that you've read that it's an organ of the digestive system. It's also a really important organ within the endocrine system. And finally, we get our male and female reproductive organs. We're going to talk about those separately from this lecture. When we get into male and female reproductive, we'll talk about the ovaries and the testes. So our focus is really going to be the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, thyroid gland, the adrenal glands, and the pancreas. Those are going to be our focal points for today. Those are going to be our focal points for labeling, for, for example, the lab, and for labeling, for example, for the uh, lecture exam that we have coming up over this unit.
So we have these guys right here. We're just kind of going over them again. Bang. Now, the endocrine system releases chemical messengers directly into the blood. And those chemical messengers that we call hormones travel through the bloodstream and they bind to receptors on distant target cells, right, which enables them to exert a physiological response. So the binding of the hormone to the receptor causes a change inside the cell that's physiologically useful, right? It's a way for the glands of the endocrine system to communicate with the cells of your body. So when you look at an endocrine cell, if I was to ask you a question on the exam and I was to say, which of the following would be true of the cell above? Well, we know it's an endocrine cell because it's producing a secretory product, right? We see this little exocytosis pathway occurring right here. And that secretory product is released directly into the bloodstream. Any gland that produces a chemical messenger that's released directly into the bloodstream is by definition an endocrine gland and that chemical messenger is called a hormone. That hormone is then going to travel through our bloodstream. So these aren't right next to each other. Let's say that I said endocrine cell of the anterior pituitary gland and let's say these distant target cells were cells in the liver, right? That hormone would be being released up here. It would enter into our bloodstream and it would travel through our bloodstream all the way to the liver, which is down here. So the hormone can be released, right, a relatively long distance away or a large distance away from the organ or the tissues that it's actually influencing. And the way that a hormone exerts an influence on a tissue is that it binds to these proteins embedded within the membrane of cells, and these proteins are called receptors. So when a hormone binds to a receptor, the message outside the cell is converted to a message inside the cell, and the cell changes something. For example, the way it's burning glucose, and maybe it upregulates the metabolism or the burning of glucose to produce more ATP. Or maybe you start breaking down glycogen so you can release glucose into the blood, right? Whatever it is, whatever this particular receptor is linked to, whatever pathway it's linked to, it can be a broad array of pathways. So in order to be considered a target cell, that cell needs to have a receptor for that particular hormone. If a cell doesn't have a receptor for that hormone, it's not considered a target cell, and not every hormone targets every cell in your body. Hormones are produced and released by endocrine glands, and those hormones have target cells, and sometimes very specific target cells throughout the body where they exert their response. So it's not binding to every single receptor in every cell. It's only binding to special receptors that will only accommodate that hormone and influence those cells. So when we refer to a target cell, what we're really talking about is a cell that has receptors for that particular hormone. So if you say parathyroid, the target of parathyroid hormone is osteoclasts, right? Those cells that break bone down. What you're really saying is that osteoclasts have these protein receptors embedded within their membrane that can physically bind to parathyroid hormone. And what that does is it increases their activity with respect to the breakdown of bone. <clears throat> if we take a receptor away and we're talking about target cells, if a cell doesn't have a receptor for a particular hormone, it's no longer categorized or classified as being a target cell. So when we talk about targets, when we start begin, when we begin our discussion of these uh, cell signaling pathways, that's what we're really saying. Does it have a protein receptor or does it not for that particular hormone? If it does, it is a target cell for that hormone. So for example, insulin, uh, the adipose cells have insulin receptors. Adipose cells would be targets of insulin. If it doesn't have a receptor, it's not considered a target cell. Now, there are lots of different classifications of hormones. But we're going to focus really on peptide, or what we can kind of consider protein hormones, and we're going to focus on steroid hormones. So peptide, or protein hormones like insulin and antidiuretic hormone, tend to be water-soluble, right? Meaning that they can dissolve in the blood plasma. And these particular class of hormones tend to have what are called extracellular receptors. So in just a moment, you're going to see that cell signaling pathway, and we're going to go over one cell signaling pathway and then another, and you can kind of follow along on your handouts.
Steroid hormones, on the other hand, are all derivatives of cholesterol, meaning that they're all built using cholesterol as a backbone. So they're modified cholesterol. And remember, when we're talking about lipids, all lipids share a characteristic. They are either completely or partially insoluble in water. In other words, they're nonpolar. And nonpolar molecules have different properties with respect to the cell membrane than polar molecules do. So we're going to talk about our protein hormones, which are water-soluble, and they bind to extracellular receptors. Our steroid hormones are not water-soluble. They're lipid-soluble. And because they're lipid-soluble, they can get right across the cell membrane, and they can bind to what are called intracellular receptors. So the mechanism by which protein or water-soluble hormones works is a little bit different than the mechanism by which steroid or lipid-soluble hormones work. And our focus, again, is going to be on water, protein or water-soluble and steroid or lipid-soluble. We're not going to delve into all the different hormones, again, because we're on a kind of condensed time frame, and this is a very, this is a survey course. We're just kind of looking at the basics here. So if you got an image like this, let's walk through this image because this is really important, especially for those of you who are entering into AMP1, which we, where we get into these pathways in a much greater degree of detail. So you have a chemical messenger floating around in the blood, and this is a peptide hormone or what we'll call a protein hormone. Now protein hormones are water soluble. And anything that's water-soluble also has to be polar, meaning it carries a charge. It has to have a basis to allow it to dissolve in water. You've got to get those hydration shells around it, right? So we know that this particular hormone can't get directly across the plasma membrane of a cell. So what you're looking at here is a cell membrane, a target cell specifically, because it has a receptor for that protein. And this protein hormone, this water-soluble hormone like insulin or antidiuretic hormone, this particular hormone can't get directly across the cell membrane, right? So because it can't get into the cell, it needs to influence the activity inside the cell via a different mechanism. And the mechanism that this uses, and again, I would follow along on your sheet because you're going to be asked questions about this, and I'm going to highlight a few important points about why extracellular receptors are beneficial, right, and what some of the advantages of using cell signaling pathways that utilize extracellular receptors are comparative to intracellular receptors, and vice versa. So the type of receptor that we're going to focus on that binds to these water-soluble hormones, right, the extracellular receptor, meaning it has a portion of its protein, the portion of this protein is facing toward the extracellular fluid, and a portion is facing toward the intracellular fluid, so now it can function as a little transducer, meaning it can uh, convey information from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. So this water-soluble hormone binds to this G-protein coupled receptor. It's called a GPCR. And the binding of this hormone to this G-protein coupled receptor activates a G-protein. That activated G-protein then activates adenylate cyclase. Now, adenylate cyclase will convert ATP into cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or CAMP. Now, imagine that for every hormone that binds, right, you activate one G-protein coupled receptor, which activates one G-protein. Each G-protein activates a molecule of adenylate cyclase, which is another protein embedded in the membrane. Now let's pretend that each activated adenylate cyclase molecule can convert 10 molecules of ATP into CAMP. So from the binding of one water-soluble protein hormone, internally in the cell, we now have 10 second signaling molecules, or second messenger molecules that are activated. So we have 10 molecules of CAMP. What actually happened to the signal there? Well, what happened to the signal is it became amplified. It would be like me telling 10 of you to go and do something. 10 of you are going to be able to do much more than just one of me. And if 10 of you tell 10 more people and those 10 people tell 10 people, you get large numbers very quickly, 
So the benefit of extracellular receptors that we're going to see is that extracellular receptors are capable of a physiological process in the cell, a cell signaling process called amplification. So each molecule of CAMP can activate multiple what are called protein kinases. So you have an inactive protein kinase, which turns into an active protein kinase. And there's even a little um, speaker icon here, so you can go over this again. Now, an activated protein kinase, protein kinases phosphorylate other proteins, meaning they pin phosphate groups. They pin these uh, phosphorus atoms linked to oxygen atoms with those charges. They pin phosphate groups to other uh, proteins. So protein kinases are really important because phosphorylating another protein, let's say we have a protein here that's not phosphorylated and a protein here that is phosphorylated, protein kinases, phosphorylating a protein is like turning a protein on, right? So when a protein kinase goes and pins a phosphate to another protein, it's like turning that protein on. So pretend I'm a protein kinase and I have 10 vacuum cleaners. Now, we only want those vacuum cleaners to be on when we're vacuuming, so those vacuum cleaners are off. But somebody says, hey, Matt, can you vacuum? I'm the protein kinase. I then go and turn those vacuums on, and those vacuums are capable of sucking stuff up. Turning those vacuums on, flicking the switch from an off to an on, is kind of like when a protein kinase phosphorylates another protein. Phosphorylating or pinning a phosphate group to another protein is kind of like turning that protein on. And whereas each camp can activate multiple protein kinases, so let's pretend that we have now a thousand activated protein kinases, right, right here, right? So we get our activated protein kinase. Let's pretend we have a thousand activated protein kinases. What we've done is we've just amplified the signal again. So now from a single molecule binding to an extracellular receptor, we have a thousand activated protein kinases. It's the reason this amplification is the reason that hormones can work so effectively at such low concentrations. That protein kinase then comes over here and pins a phosphate to a protein that process is called phosphorylation, and when a protein kinase pins a phosphate to a protein, right, that phosphorylation activates that protein, and let's say this protein was responsible for breaking glycogen down into glucose, right? So this protein is responsible for breaking glycogen down into glucose. So now... Every one of those activated protein kinases can activate hundreds of proteins, can phosphorylate hundreds of proteins, and you can potentially have millions of phosphorylated proteins. So from a single molecule binding up here, you can actually activate millions of molecules, specifically with proteins, little pieces of machinery inside the cell, and you can get a whopping physiological response. The binding of these protein hormones to these extracellular receptors therefore can trigger massive responses because the signal is amplified along every step until you ultimately have millions of activated proteins. These pathways tend to happen much more quickly also than, for example, steroid hormone pathways, which we're going to talk about next, because all of these proteins have already been made. So you're activating pre-existing proteins within the cell, and because of that, you can actually get a relatively rapid response. So protein hormones work a little bit differently than steroid hormones. Now remember, even though this isn't the four rings, just pretend this lipid-soluble hormone, the only lipid-soluble hormone we're going to be looking at are steroid hormones. So let's say this is testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, whatever it is. Remember that steroid hormones can't actually dissolve in blood plasma. They have to be transported around by a protein uh, sometimes called an albumin. Right? So albumins can transport lipid-soluble signaling molecules, so can other globular, globular proteins that we'll talk about when we get into the blood. So because these can't dissolve directly in the blood plasma, they have to have these proteins that latch to them, make them soluble in the blood plasma, and transport them around the body, and then they detach from those particular signaling molecules when they reach a target cell.
Now, these steroid molecules, this could be, let's say it's testosterone, right? They diffuse directly across the phospholipid bilayer. Notice there is no receptor embedded within the cell membrane. That's because these guys are lipid soluble and the phospholipid bilayer presents no barrier because they can get right across via simple diffusion. So right off the bat, if you see a hormone getting right across the phospholipid bilayer for this exam, you know you're talking about a steroid hormone, right? Protein hormones can't do that. They carry a charge. They bounce off. They need to bind to an extracellular receptor. And so then what happens with steroid hormones is they bind to an intracellular receptor, a receptor within the cell, and the binding to this intracellular receptor usually impacts a process called gene expression. Now we talked about gene expression in an earlier set of lectures, but remember gene expression is essentially the process by which DNA is used to make mRNA, right? That process is called transcription. That mRNA wiggles out of the nucleus, binds to a ribosome, and that ribosome uses the information in that mRNA to latch or link amino acids together covalently via peptide bonds to form a protein. So what steroid hormones do is they change gene expression. And that's another way of saying rather than activating pre-existing proteins, steroid hormones, by binding to their intracellular receptors, change the way that proteins are being made, meaning that they can trigger the creation or formation of proteins from scratch. So if I was to take a shot of insulin, that's a protein hormone. It's going to bind to an extracellular receptor, and it's going to bring my blood glucose levels down pretty darn quick, right? It's going to be pretty quick. That's because it's going to bind to that extracellular receptor. You're going to get those amplification cascades, and you're going to see um, many, many activated proteins within the cell. Glucagon, another big one. Um, with these steroid hormones, you're not going to get as fast of a response because these steroid hormones actually change the way that proteins are being made. And the uh, example I always like to give is, would it take longer to turn on 50 vacuum cleaners that are already made or to construct those vacuum cleaners from scratch? Well, of course, it'd be a lot quicker to turn on those pre-existing vacuum cleaners than to construct vacuum cleaners from scratch. So this is a really powerful pathway. Steroids are really powerful hormones, but they work by changing gene expression and shifting gene expression in right? Synthesizing proteins from scratch is a time-consuming process, so it takes a little while to work. So if I was to start taking uh, estrogen, right, it, because I wanted to, you know, uh, I, I was taking estrogen because I wanted to undergo a gender reassignment surgery or something like that, it wouldn't be an immediate response you would see. It would be a slow response, but it would be a very powerful response because we're ultimately fundamentally changing the way that genes are expressed. Now, with those kind of basics in mind, let's start thinking about endocrine disorders so when I use terms later on, they make sense. Endocrine disorders can essentially be broken into three categories. We have diseases of hypersecretion, where you produce too much of a hormone, like hyperthyroidism. You have diseases of hyposecretion, where you produce too little of a hormone, like hypothyroidism. And then you have diseases in which the hormone doesn't work or the protein receptor for that hormone is not being responsive to that hormone. When the hormone doesn't work properly at a target cell, we refer to that as a disease of insensitivity. So we have diseases of hypersecretion, diseases of hyposecretion, and diseases of insensitivity. And I'm going to bring those up throughout the context or the course of this lecture, and I'm going to give you a context in which to think about those. So the hypothalamus controls the activity of both the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is a brain structure, and the pituitary gland is an endocrine structure. Whenever we talk about the hypothalamus controlling the pituitary gland, one, we can refer to that as neuroendocrine regulation or neuroendocrine control. It's a nervous system structure controlling the pituitary 
structure. Another way that it's often referred to is we talk about an axis. An axis is just essentially communicating structures when you're referring to neuroendocrine control. A lot of the axes that we care about start off with HP. So H means hypothalamus and P means pituitary. So the hypothalamic pituitary axis, when you see like HP axis, you're just talking about the fact that the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. Now the pituitary gland then controls many other glands. So when you use uh, a term like the HPA axis, you're talking about the hypothalamus controlling the pituitary, the pituitary controlling the adrenal gland. When you talk about the HPT axis, you're talking about the hypothalamus controlling the pituitary, the pituitary controlling the thyroid gland. So HPA, HPT axis is just referring that to that communication that happens between the nervous system and the endocrine system, and then even between endocrine structures. Now, a tropic hormone is a hormone released by one gland that tells another gland to release a hormone. So there are lots of hormones that are released in one area, right? And remember, a hormone is just a chemical messenger secreted directly into the blood. And those hormones travel through the blood and they bind to receptors on another endocrine gland and they trigger that gland to release another hormone. So a tropic hormone is just a hormone released by one gland that tells another gland to release a hormone. And the way that the HP axis works is the hypothalamus, when it's controlling the anterior pituitary gland, produces a hormone, right? Even though it's a brain structure, it produces something called a neurohormone, but don't worry about that. It's a hormone. It's released into the blood and it travels to the anterior pituitary where it tells the anterior pituitary to release another hormone. So when you look at the hypothalamus, I want you to start thinking about filling this sheet out. The hypothalamus is a brain structure. Now it serves a lot of uh, important functions. We talked about them earlier. Uh, the hypothalamus is an important mediator of autonomic function, meaning it controls things like uh, blood pressure, heart rate, things like that. It has overriding control of a lot of different centers. But one of the things I really want to solidify here is that the hypothalamus regulates the activity of the pituitary gland. Now, what you're looking at on this particular flow chart is the hierarchy of control. So the hypothalamus regulates both the anterior and posterior pituitary gland. The anterior and posterior pituitary gland regulate a wide array of other functions. So we're going to walk through your handout one by one here. Now the way that the hypothalamus regulates the activity of the anterior pituitary gland is by releasing a set of hormones that are all referred to as releasing hormones. So you can have, for example, growth hormone releasing hormone or prolactin releasing hormone. If a hormone has the end term releasing hormone attached to it, growth hormone releasing hormone, prolactin releasing hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, if the word releasing hormone is in the name of a hormone, that hormone is synthesized and released by the hypothalamus, which remember is a brain structure, right? But that's how this brain structure communicates with the pituitary structures. It communicates with the anterior pituitary by producing a tropic hormone called a releasing hormone. And those releasing hormones right, then tell the anterior pituitary gland to produce and release another hormone. So if I say which of the following would be true of the hypothalamus with respect to the way it controls the anterior pituitary gland? Well, the hypothalamus, which is a brain structure, controls the anterior pituitary gland by producing and releasing a class of hormones that we collectively refer to as releasing hormones. Those releasing hormones then travel to the anterior pituitary gland where they trigger the release of another hormone.
So you know the hypothalamus produces a hormone called a releasing hormone, and it can be a there are a variety of different releasing hormones, right? You don't have to know them all. If you hear growth hormone, releasing hormone, hypothalamus, prolactin releasing, if it has releasing hormone in its name, it's produced by the hypothalamus for this class. So we have releasing hormones. Hypothalamus produces releasing hormones. Those enter into a blood vessel network that you guys don't have to know. It's called the hypothalamic hypophysial portal network, but you guys don't have to know it. And those releasing hormones tell the anterior pituitary gland to release a set of hormones. So for example, growth hormone releasing hormone tells the anterior pituitary gland to synthesize and release a hormone called growth hormone. Growth hormone then has targets, meaning it has a wide variety of target cells, like the liver, and we won't get into insulin-like growth factors again in introductory class, your skeletal muscles, the osteoblast in your bone. So growth hormone has a bunch of different targets, right? Meaning it has receptors on a bunch of different types of cells. And when growth hormone binds to the receptors on those different types of cells, it triggers growth. So growth hormone is really important in the maintenance of organs, in wound healing, right? In the maintenance of muscle and different types of tissues. And where you get your biggest spike of growth hormone, right? The, the time of day when you get your largest spike or that increase in growth hormone is actually while you're sleeping. So if you do something like exercise, you're going to want to get a good night's sleep after that because while you're sleeping, you're going to get a spike in this pathway that produces the release of growth hormone, right, or results in the release of growth hormone. And then that growth hormone goes to things like your skeletal muscles and it says repair yourself, right? It goes to your organs and it binds to the receptors on the cell and it triggers things like mitosis, right? So it, it uh, provides the message. It, it's the messenger that essentially maintains or tells the body to... <clears throat> perform basic upkeep and maintenance. It's also really important in, in um, things like wound healing and tissue repair. So now you have releasing hormone and you have growth hormone releasing hormone. You have another releasing hormone and you don't have to remember all the releasing hormones. If it has releasing hormone at the end of the word or the end of the hormone's name is releasing hormone, it's produced by the hypothalamus. But you get prolactin releasing hormone. Prolactin releasing hormone travels to the anterior pituitary gland where it triggers the uh, release of a hormone called prolactin. Prolactin then has target cells in the mammary glands. So that hormone travels to the mammary glands and it binds to receptors on the surface of the cells making up the mammary glands. And when prolactin binds to those cells, it actually triggers lactation. So you start synthesizing and producing milk and it can trigger a milk drop reflex. And uh, it's really important, for example, during pregnancy. Now, another thing that I'll point out for you men is men can sometimes lactate. And sometimes lactation in men can be a really dangerous sign. It can sometimes indicate something like a tumor on the pituitary gland. And sometimes when tumors form on the pituitary gland, they start producing hormones inappropriately. And prolactin is one of those hormones that can potentially be stimulated inappropriately. So you can see men start to lactate. And that's definitely warrants, for example, maybe like an MRI or something just to check out those brain tissues. Not a good sign. Not always indicative of cancer, but it can be. Now, another hormone that's released, right, by the anterior pituitary gland, so you get TRH, which is essentially thyroid-releasing hormone, travels to the anterior pituitary gland, and in response, the anterior pituitary gland produces thyroid-stimulating hormone. Not thyroid hormone, but thyroid-stimulating hormone. So whereas releasing hormone is a tropic hormone, it travels from one area and it tells another gland, hey, release a hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone is also a tropic hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone is a tropic hormone that physically travels to the thyroid gland where it triggers the release of thyroid hormone. So thyroid stimulating hormone travels to the thyroid gland, stimulates the release of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone then has receptors and cells embedded all throughout the body. And when thyroid hormone binds to those receptors, it upregulates metabolism, meaning it triggers 
metabolism. It causes metabolism to work more quickly. So let's say, for example, it triggers pathways that break down <coughs> or are responsible for the metabolism of fats or the catabolic breakdown of fats or it triggers pathways that upregulate ATP production. Whatever those pathways are, it upregulates metabolism. So when we talk about our disorders in just a little bit, I want you to know that thyroid hormone, its general functional role is to increase metabolism and it does so through a variety of different mechanisms. But that's important to know. And thyroid stimulating hormone is different than thyroid hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone is produced by the anterior pituitary gland and it tells the thyroid gland to produce thyroid hormone which then serves the active role of binding to receptors on cells located throughout the body where it upregulates metabolism. So you have two tropic hormones in that pathway. Now another pathway that involves multiple tropic hormones is when the hypothalamus so this pathway is associated with stress. We're about to talk about the stress pathway. So let's say you have something like an exam coming up in an intro anatomy and physiology class and you're like, God, I don't want to be around that bloody professor anymore and I uh, am getting super stressed out by this. That's going to activate your limbic system, which is kind of your emotional brain. And that limbic circuitry is eventually going to communicate to the hypothalamus, hey, we're stressed out. The hypothalamus is going to produce a a hormone called cortotropin releasing hormone or CRH just have to know the releasing hormone that CRH is going to trigger the release of another tropic hormone called adrenocortotropic hormone or ACTH ACTH is a tropic hormone released by the anterior pituitary gland in response to stress so the brain activates that stress pathway and then it tells the anterior pituitary gland to release another hormone that's associated with stress. The release of ACTH by the anterior pituitary gland is a stress response. ACTH is a tropic hormone that then travels to the adrenal gland where it triggers the production and release of cortisol. Cortisol is your body's stress hormone. Cortisol then travels to a wide variety of cells and the two uh, responses of cortisol that I want you to be familiar with are that cortisol increases blood glucose concentrations. So cortisol increases blood glucose concentrations and it dampens down inflammation, meaning it suppresses the immune system. So it jacks up your blood sugar and it to plummets your immune system. Why? Well, let's think about why we would release stress hormone in a healthy situation. So you have the hypothalamus, Right? You're responding to a stressful situation, like you have somebody running at you or you need to get away from somebody, right? And you need to activate your body in order to do that. There are a variety of mechanisms. This is one. So you have a real physiological stressor. Let's say it's me walking toward you. The hypothalamus, the limbic system, your emotional brain, starts bouncing off, you know, all the, bouncing that information around and it eventually makes its way to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus says, let's produce CRH, this releasing hormone. CRH triggers the release of ACTH, which is another tropic hormone released by the anterior pituitary. ACTH then travels to the adrenal gland where it triggers the release of cortisol. So now... A, a set of thoughts in your mind, and thoughts are neurobiological, have a neurobiological underpinning, right? There's action potentials, there's chemical signals going on, but these thoughts that we think are relegated to our brain have now become a shift in the biochemistry of our body. So when you get stressed out, when you have mental stress, right, you're likely to produce cortisol. Cortisol then binds to its target cells where it jacks up your blood glucose and it decreases the activity of your immune system. So it dampens down inflammation, right? It's essentially cortisone, right? That's how, that's how it was discovered, but I won't get into that. If, now, if you release cortisol, right, if you activate this stress pathway and release cortisol in the face of a real stressor, like a lion chasing you, then 
that's an appropriate time and it's very adaptive. If a lion is chasing you, you're going to want to have plenty of glucose in your blood so your skeletal muscles can burn glucose for energy. And you're not going to want to be activating your immune system because you're going to want to dampen down inflammation at things like joints so you can move a little bit more readily. The problem is, is when you get this pathway activated in response to something that isn't a real physiological stressor, right? It's a psychological stressor, but not a physiological stressor, meaning that it's, it doesn't pose an imminent threat to your well-being. So like an exam, for example, the worst that can happen with an exam is that you can get an F on it. But we have these big evolved brains that are capable of you know, constructing all of these potential outcomes. They're capable of, of ruminating over things and thinking about things really deeply, right? And anticipating uh, events that haven't even happened yet. We call that worry. And those worry pathways can activate your limbic system and tell the hypothalamus, hey, we're stressed. Hypothalamus then tells anterior pituitary, release ACTH. ACTH tells the adrenal glands to release cortisol. So you're worrying about something that your brain has, it functions like a simulator. It simulates events that haven't happened. And now you've simulated events that haven't happened, probably never will happen. Worrying is like uh, uh, using your imagination to pretend things that you don't ever want to have happen, right? And now this worry has triggered the release of cortisol. Now these activities in your brain have triggered a very real change in your biochemistry. Cortisol then jacks up your blood glucose, suppresses your immune system. That's the reason you get sick during like exam time. It's the reason that stress is linked to things like opportunistic infections or with the blood glucose, increased body weight, high, high blood pressure, etc. So thoughts in your mind can become re very real biochemical changes in your body. That's what I'm getting at. Now, the posterior pituitary gland, the hypothalamus regulates the posterior pituitary gland directly, and the posterior pituitary gland is kind of like an extension of the hypothalamus, even though it's an a endocrine structure, right? So the hypothalamus regulates the posterior pituitary gland directly, and the posterior pituitary gland produces two hormones. Now, the stimulus for the release of one of those hormones is dehydration. So let's say you get dehydrated, and when you get dehydrated, the concentration of your blood plasma increases. Well, your hypothalamus is monitoring the concentration of your blood plasma, and it goes, whoa, concentration of blood plasma increased, right? That's indicative of dehydration. So it goes, hey, posterior pituitary gland, you got to release a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Antidiuretic hormone travels to the kidneys where it triggers the reabsorption of water. If you get the reabsorption of water, you're going to start diluting out that blood plasma a little bit, and hopefully that reestablishes homeostasis. The hypothalamus will also trigger pathways associated with thirst in, the, in response to elevations in blood plasma. So if you're thirsty, you're probably already dehydrated. The other hormone the posterior pituitary gland produces that's important for you guys to know for this upcoming exam is oxytocin. So we've talked about the two positive feedback cycles you need to know for uh, feedback pathways that you need to know for this class, childbirth and blood clotting. Well, in childbirth, stretch on the cervix is detected by stretch receptors and that information goes right and is ultimately processed or integrated by the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus says oh man the cervix is stretching that means a baby is being born right or a baby needs to be born so in response to that stretch on the cervix the hypothalamus tells the posterior pituitary gland to release oxytocin Oxytocin then travels through the bloodstream where it binds to the smooth muscle lining the uterus and it triggers it to contract even more forcefully until that baby is out. Now, so when you hear about women inducing labor at like week 39, a lot of doctors will induce labor in women at week 39 because babies have this first poop called meconium. And after week 39, the chance that they're pooping into the amniotic fluid increases, and they can actually inhale that poop, and they can get it in their lungs, and it can cause an infection in their lungs after they're born. So you want to pay attention to things like that. So doctors will actually induce birth using pitocin. Pitocin is just a synthetic form of oxytocin.
It's just a synthetic oxytocin. And what's it, what it's going to do is trigger uterine contractions. So oxytocin is also a really important hormone. I mean, some people have called it the love hormone. You get spikes of it after having orgasms, after you see people you like. It's important in pair bond formation, particularly between mother and child or between partners. It's a really, really interesting hormone. I wish we had more time to talk about it, but you don't care, and it's getting late. So pituitary gland histology. Up here, number three, we're looking at the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus controls both the anterior and posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is going to be larger than the posterior pituitary, and it's always going to stain a little bit darker because it's true glandular tissue. The posterior pituitary is always going to be a little bit smaller, and it's going to stain a little bit lighter because it's essentially an extension of the nervous tissue, even though it's an endocrine structure. It just stains lighter as a consequence of what it's made out of. So we have the hypothalamus anterior and posterior pituitary, and the infundibulum isn't on your list for this class, so that's fine. Now, the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland rests on the anterior aspect of the trachea and the thyroid cartilage and the larynx. It's shaped like a little butterfly. And here we have our thyroid gland. You can palpate your thyroid gland. If we were to take a chunk of this thyroid gland and look at it under a microscope, you would see these simple cuboidal epithelial cells arranged in these spherical, so even though it looks like circles, they're really spheres, but arranged in kind of this circular pattern, even though you can imagine them as being spheres, called follicles. Now these cells are referred to as follicular cells, and the substance that you find within them that's responsible for actually synthesizing thyroid hormone, which again is not something you need to know for this class, is called colloid. So they secrete the precursor of thyroid hormone and then thyroid hormone, the T3 and T4 comes back up and gets pop, pumped out to the blood. Again, we're not going to get into that in a great amount of detail, but that's what the thyroid gland looks like histologically. Now remember the thyroid gland in response to thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary gland produces thyroid hormone and thyroid hormone influences metabolism. It causes metabolism to work, uh, to upregulate metabolism or for metabolism to work more quickly. So when you think about um, the thyroid gland and you think about metabolism, you can think about the different conditions that would affect the thyroid gland. So you have hypothyroidism and you have hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism is a disease of hypersecretion in which you're not producing enough thyroid hormone. If you're not producing enough thyroid hormone, metabolism is going to decrease. When metabolism decreases, the way that people present with hypothyroidism is they're lethargic, fatigued, they are cold intolerant, meaning that they're cold all the time, they're forgetful, they start having muscle aches, they have weight gain. All those things that you would associate with a decreased metabolism. Notably, feeling cold, fatigued, and gaining weight, right? Those are kind of the hallmark characteristics of hypothyroidism. And it makes sense. If you don't have the hormone that tells cells, hey, we need to upregulate our metabolism, those cells are going to start working really slowly, and it's going to manifest as these symptoms that patients come in with, these physiological signs like weight gain that these patients come in with. Hyperthyroidism, which is where you're producing too much thyroid hormone, on the other hand, presents completely differently. Difficulty sleeping, heat intolerance, you feel hot all the time, you're irritable, you can't sleep, you're nervous, you're losing weight like crazy and you don't know why. Right? So they present totally oppositely from one another. And I may give you something like a clinical question that asks that. For example, on your sheets, I say, which of the following would be true if the structure associated with the image was destroyed by an autoimmune disease. So you go, okay, what's the structure indicated by the image? Well, we're looking at the thyroid gland. We know that because we have our follicular cells here, our colloid. We're looking at a follicle. That's the telltale histological characteristic of the thyroid gland for me to know on this exam. If that gland is being destroyed, we're not going to produce as much thyroid hormone. If we're not producing thyroid hormone, we're not going to be able to tell ourselves to work harder or upregulate our metabolism. 
If we can't upregulate our metabolism, we're going to feel cold and tired all the time, and it's going to be really easy for us to gain weight, and our fingernails and our is, are going to be brittle. Our hair is going to be, you know, with the, the, like cracked or like dry and coarse. You're going to start losing your hair, and those are the telltale uh, symptoms, signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. So it could be an autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and Thyroid diseases, hypothyroidism is absolutely epidemic in developed countries. There are millions of cases, probably millions more undiagnosed. It is a serious public health concern. The adrenal gland. So when you're looking at the adrenal gland, they sit on each kidney, and I've given you an, Im an image in which you see the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. Now, you don't have to know the different layers but I do want you to know two hormones released by the adrenal cortex. The first is cortisol. Cortisol is your body's stress hormone. The second is aldosterone. Aldosterone plays a really important role in reabsorbing salts in the kidney, right? It plays a really important role in electrolyte balance. Again, this is an intro class, so if you're in a different YouTube universe and you're like, ah, oh, it does way more than that, I am giving, they get one lecture over the endocrine system, so chill out. Now, the adrenal medulla is a little bit different. The adrenal medulla is perfused with blood vessels, and it also releases a set of hormones. The hormones it releases are epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are adrenaline. So when your fight-or-flight systems activate, you get the release not only of cortisol, but more directly and more quickly of epinephrine and norepinephrine, a.k.a. adrenaline or noradrenaline. Now, we talked about cortisol being your body's stress hormone. So when you're stressed out, you're releasing cortisol, and that cortisol can jack up your blood glucose, suppress your immune system, open you up to all types of things. So try to schedule a massage or laugh like a child or spend time with a bloody pet or maybe even take up gardening or put a bag on your head. Oh, that's the guy who's stressed out. Okay. But do something about it because it's serious. Now, the parathyroid glands are arguably just as important as the thyroid gland, and they're not regulated by the anterior pituitary gland, so we're going to discuss these independently. So the parathyroid glands are histologically and functionally unique chunks of tissue on the thyroid gland. The role of the parathyroid gland is they play a really important role in maintaining calcium homeostasis, meaning regulating the amount of calcium in your body, right, and specifically in your blood. And calcium regulation is really, really important. You don't want to throw that off. So when we think about how the parathyroid glands actually regulate blood calcium, let's go and let's look at our little... Um, table that we need to fill out associated with this and think about this for the exam. So you have your parathyroid glands on the back of your thyroid, can't really feel them, they're like the size of a grain of rice. The stimulus that activates the parathyroid glands is low blood calcium. The receptor is the parathyroid glands, the control center is the parathyroid glands, and what the parathyroid glands do is they release an effector, right? The effector of an endocrine-mediated feedback pathway is always going to be the hormone because that's what affects the change, and they're going to release the effector. The effector in this case is a hormone called parathyroid hormone, or PTH. Parathyroid hormone has multiple targets. Its primary target is osteoclasts. So osteoclasts have receptors for parathyroid hormone. When parathyroid hormone binds to them, it upregulates their activity and they start resorbing or breaking bone down faster, and the calcium salts from that broken down bone are released into the blood where they increase blood calcium levels. Parathyroid hormone also triggers reabsorption of calcium in the kidneys and absorption of calcium along the GI tract, but its primary target is osteoclast in bone. That's also its primary pathology. So let's say you have a... a, a Common disorder in endocrinology, well, not so common, but a disorder that endocrinologists will sometimes see is something called hyperparathyroidism. Not hyperthyroidism, but hyperparathyroidism. This is when the parathyroid glands are producing too much thyroid hormone at any given point in time, even though calcium concentrations are fine in the blood or maybe even too high. 
So a lot of times doctors will catch hyperparathyroidism because they'll do a routine chem panel. So they'll take out blood and they'll run the chem panel on it and they'll see that calcium is elevated and they'll go, whoa, calcium levels are really high. I wonder what's going on. And then a uh, reasonable follow-up exam to that would be looking for parathyroid hormone levels. Well, when the parathyroid glands are overactive and they release too much parathyroid hormone, the calcium levels in your blood spike, which open you up to things like kidney stones and interferes with the way that uh, uh, different processes, notably like cardiac action potentials, take place. But another thing that they do is they start weakening bone. If you have too much parathyroid hormone, right, those osteoclasts are going to be going crazy and they're going to start eating your holes in your bone. And you're, it's going to open you up or predispose you to uh, the premature development of a disease like osteoporosis. So it's just something to keep in mind. Now, last but not least, we have the pancreas. There are multiple mechanisms that govern the pathways that we're going to talk about, but we're going to talk about the purely endocrine aspect of the pancreas. <clears throat> we're not going to talk about nervous system input or anything that you get in AMP2. Again, chill out, YouTube universe. This is an intro class. So the pancreas consists of exocrine tissue, right? It's called uh, acinar tissue, and what this exocrine tissue does is it produces digestive enzymes that eventually get funneled into this thing called the pancreatic duct and those digestive enzymes are released into the lumen of the GI tract. So when I say the pancreas has both exocrine and endocrine functions, I mean it functions as an exocrine gland. It also functions as an endocrine gland. The little endocrine portions of the pancreas, so here all of these are exocrine cells and notice that they stain way darker. Now, there are little islands of endocrine cells referred to as islets of Langerhans within the pancreas. And these islets of Langerhans in the pancreas have what are called beta and alpha pancreatic cells. Beta pancreatic cells are responsible for producing insulin. Alpha pancreatic cells are responsible for producing glucagon. Now, if you follow with this pathway, let's say you eat something that has glucose in it. Glucose levels increase. That increase in glucose is detected by beta pancreatic cells. It's processed, or the control center is also beta pancreatic cells, and those beta pancreatic cells release insulin. Insulin has a few really important targets, notably fat and skeletal muscle, adipose tissue and skeletal muscle tissue. And what it does is it upregulates the absorption of glucose into the cell and how quickly the cell is using glucose. So if you're sucking glucose out of the blood into the cells, blood glucose levels are going to return back to normal. They're going to drop, right? So insulin, right, binds to these target cells, notably adipose tissue and skeletal muscle tissue, where it triggers those cells to start sucking glucose in and using that glucose. And when they suck glucose in and use that glucose, blood glucose levels drop. Right, So the response is a decrease in blood glucose, making this a negative feedback pathway. Now, when glucose levels are too low, alpha pancreatic cells detect that. They process that information, meaning they function like little control centers, and they release an effector called glucagon. Glucagon does the exact opposite of insulin. Glucagon increases glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen to form individual glucose molecules, and then those glucose molecules are released from the liver, and what happens is glucose levels rise. Now again, it's another negative feedback pathway because the response and the stimulus are opposite of one another, or the response negates the stimulus, and a norm is reestablished. When you think about diabetes, just in very general terms, and it's something you're going to see clinically quite frequently, especially in the United States, there's type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a disease for the most part of, in, uh, or pardon me, of hyposecretion. So in type 1 diabetes, what ends up happening is it's an autoimmune disease in which beta pancreatic cells are destroyed. So type 1 diabetes, about 5% of diabetics in the U.S. are type 1 diabetics, by the way, to give you an idea of the ratio there, right? Give or take, depending on the year of the study. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease in which these islets of Langerhans are destroyed. 
specifically beta pancreatic cells. When these beta pancreatic cells are destroyed, the body can no longer release insulin. When the body can no longer release insulin, blood glucose levels are going to remain perpetually elevated, right? Now, type 1 diabetes used to be a death sentence until we discovered how to mass produce, discovered insulin and how to mass produce insulin, and those discoveries were very important and we could go on at length about those. But the bottom line is that's a disease of hyposecretion. And how do you correct type 1 diabetes? Well, you use things like insulin pumps. So people can even get an insulin pump put in. And if you are good about controlling or regulating your food intake and when you administer that insulin and you stick on a, a regimented routine, type 1 diabetes is a very manageable disease. It sucks, but it's manageable. Type 2 diabetes, on the other hand, we used to call it adult onset. It can no longer be called adult onset diabetes because uh, many children are now developing it due to lifestyle factors. It's what we often associate with a disease of lifestyle. Now that's a little unfair and I'm, I'm not, uh, in AMP2 we have three lectures dedicated to diabetes. I'm just breaking down the brass tacks here. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of insensitivity for all intents and purposes. You have plenty of insulin, but that insulin is no longer working because those pathways have been downregulated, meaning those cells are no longer sensitive to insulin. So if those cells aren't as sensitive to insulin anymore, insulin isn't going to be doing its job appropriately, and you're going to have elevated blood glucose. Elevated blood glucose, you don't think it's a big deal, but man, it has, it drops your blood pressure, prevents blood flow, sticks to everything, creates you know, diffusion barriers that interfere with lung function and gas exchange. It's a multi-system disease. It's massively problematic. So it's really a disease of insensitivity. So there are multiple treatments for it, predominantly medication, but one of the best things you can do is just change your diet and exercise, right? You have all the medical interventions in the world, but diet and exercise um, really are an important uh, aspect of managing type 2 diabetes. And with that said, I got all the points across I wanted to get across in this lecture, so have a good day.